Hello and welcome to another session of Discipleship Explored. Today we move our thinking to the end of Philippians chapter 1 and into chapter 2. And we think about what it means to live a life together in Christ. How do we apply the gospel message and where do we position ourselves in relation to others and God himself? Session three is entitled Standing Together in Christ. Stay tuned and we'll unpack more of Paul's writings together. Last week, we considered living in Christ, this idea that as Christians, we surrender our personal desires over to God, living as Paul wrote, is Christ and to die is gain. Today, we are going to be thinking about thinking about being sure of what we believe and working together for the gospel. Facing opposition, it is possible even when our attitude is like that of Jesus Christ. But having that attitude is not always easy to achieve. Our focus is on Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 through to chapter 2 verse 11. And just now we are going to hear that being read to us. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Philippians 2 Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Question 1. According to Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, what does it mean to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? One of the most challenging things about being in a church fellowship is establishing unity. Any group of people who come together with their different backgrounds, experiences, cultures, ideas and passions. How can we put all that to one side or even use that in a way of uniting people for the sake of the gospel? Standing together in a manner worthy of the gospel will result in a confident fellowship in the spirit, striving together with one accord for the faith of the gospel, as Paul writes. But to do this, we need to understand what the gospel message is all about. Anyone whose understanding of the Christian faith is limited may believe that churches are made up of perfect people. In no way is that true, and in no way does scripture support that thinking. Christians make mistakes. We all, from time to time, take our eyes away from Christ and his teaching and believe that our way is the best way. Living a life 
worthy of the gospel is not about living a perfect life. It is about living a life focused on the teachings of Christ. It is about allowing the Holy Spirit to be our guide and provider and relying on his strength to take us through the darkest valleys. A life of holy living, pure and righteous for God's glory. What Paul is saying is that he has confidence in the Philippian church to unite for the purpose of the gospel. In other words, all they do as individuals and as a corporate body of believers is to proclaim the gospel message through their words and their actions. The message of salvation, of forgiveness, of love and life. The coming together of people's skills, gifts, experiences, knowledge, all of that, united into the one purpose and one use can be a wonderful thing. God doesn't grant us all the same skills. He doesn't give us all the same experience and backgrounds. We are all different. But if the church of believers unites together, imagine the wonderful things that can be achieved, all because they are surrendering their personal desires and, and unite themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. On our own with God, great things can be achieved. Together with God, even greater things can be achieved. Question two. What opportunities do you have to contend for the gospel by sharing your faith with others? I think this is a, an interesting choice of word, contend. According to Google Dictionary, contend means to struggle to surmount and assert something as, as a position in an argument. It is not clear which definition the material is suggesting we refer to, so let's look at both. What options do you have to struggle for the gospel by sharing your faith with others? For some, this may be working in an environment where, they, where you are the only Christian, surrounded by unhealthy living people all day, people who think differently and live by selfish desires. For some in our world, this may be expressing their worship and their praise to God in isolation, hidden from society because it is illegal for Christian worship to take place and comes with severe punishments. But what about the other meaning? What opportunities do you have to assert your position for the gospel by sharing your faith with others? In other words, how would you forcefully or confidently state your belief in the gospel and share your faith with others? This is something Paul would have been very much aware of as being a real challenge for the Philippian church. He was in prison because he testified to an experience with Christ and proclaimed Christ was the saviour of the world, the only one who can deliver true salvation. If you're the only Christian in the work environment, how do you stand out? If you're the only Christian in your neighbourhood, in your community where you live, how do you stand out? How is your life different to those around you? If you believe full life is only found in Christ Jesus, how do you resist the temptations and questions posed by those around you? How do you stand your ground when everyone spends their Sundays in bed or hanging around the street corner and you go to church or listen to services online? Standing strong in faith is important. It was important for the Philippian church and it is important for us today. History in the UK has shown a decline in church membership, and there are a number of factors which contribute to that. This isn't, isn't about whether or not those decisions are right or wrong. This is about how do Christians today confidently stand up for their belief. Yes, there will be moments of struggle, but we, as we have considered already, uniting as a body of believers under God will only result in extraordinary outcomes. Changes to society and way of life which has impacted church attendance has come about through decisions made and actions taken over a number of decades and to a degree there isn't a lot we can do about that. The responsibility now lies with individual Christians who are in a position not to detest those decisions or that outcome but to work with it. What opportunities does life today give us for us to share our faith? People are looking for something to, to fill the missing element in their life. And it could be you who God is choosing to bridge that gap and introduce them to Christ. 
Question 3. Paul and the Philippian church faced opposition because they were contending for the gospel. See verses 28 to 30. Why might we face opposition to the gospel today? Paul assures the Philippian church that their faith in Christ will save them. Their opposers will be destroyed. We read in verse 28, but they, the faithful followers of Christ, will be saved. From the early days of creation, life has been about good and evil. Genesis tells the story of how the serpent tempted Eve into eating the apple, which God said she should not do. Then in turn, Adam did the same. Today, there are people whose ambition it is to destroy, whether that is uh, political parties or nations, military forces, buildings, people's lives or religious and faith-based groups. They want to tear things down. It isn't new for us and it wasn't new for, for the Philippian church to be opposed. The difference is, certainly here in Northern Ireland and throughout the UK, is that we might not see the same level of opposition towards the church that may exist in other countries around the world. So what opposition does face the church today? Well, this would vary from place to place and no specific location is being considered when I list these things. But opposition can come in the form of members of the public protesting against the building of a new church. Outdoor events can, can be a place that is disrespected by others and trying to turn the event into them or into something that it isn't. Vandalism to church property, even church members can prioritise their time, talent and treasure to that which the church may feel strongly against. Opposition can come in many forms from without and within the church fellowship. Forms which prevent or tries to prevent the church from carrying out its mission of proclaiming the gospel of Christ Jesus. Have you experienced any form of opposition in churches in your life? Question four. In verses 28 to 30, Paul makes some surprising statements from these verses, what should we remember when we face opposition? Firstly, Paul says we shouldn't be frightened. We have confidence in the living gospel message. Don't be afraid of those who oppose us, but surrender ourselves to Christ, for he has overcome the world. Paul affirms us in verse 29 that suffering for Christ will happen. Paul experienced it and so will the church. Remember, Paul's letter is about encouraging new Christians on their journey of faith. So when he says you have seen me struggle for the sake of the gospel, his readers can be assured that for every experience we go through and they went through, God still has a plan. Something in that experience will strengthen us and our faith. But by believing in God, we are saved. That's not to say we won't experience trouble or opposition. That is to say, we face these moments confident of his presence and protected by his spirit. Question five. What does it mean to stand together, according to Paul in Philippians 2.2? This verse says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. What does Paul mean? He means selfish ambition brings discord. It breaks down the fellowship. His message to the Philippian church in these verses is that working together, caring for the problems of others as if they were our problems, demonstrates the example of Jesus Christ, the example of putting others first. And by doing so, we experience unity. Being in a relationship with God is not about our own needs. God will take care of those. It is about relationship with those around us. Effective relationships where the purpose of gospel living and gospel sharing is a priority. Nowhere does Paul say we should all think the same, do the same and look the same. Jesus called many different people into relationship with him. People from different backgrounds with different abilities. We have spoken a lot about this throughout the series, and it is because it is important to realise that no matter who we are, what we've done, and what we can do, we are still chosen, named and known by God. Our differences unite us. 
Bringing our differences together for the one purpose is how God calls us to stand together, to fight against the opposition with love and forgiveness, and seek his kingdom through praise and worship to God. The Apostle Peter writes in his second letter, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Why should we do that? Because as he writes earlier in the chapter, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. What does it mean to stand together? It means to stand united in our beliefs of who God is, what the gospel message is, and how God can use us to glorify his name through our good deeds. Be like-minded, says Paul, with the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Don't let your differences break your unity, but rather let your differences unite under the common purpose. Question 6. What will it mean in practice for us to consider others better than ourselves? I firmly believe in self-worth. We should credit ourselves when we achieve something, but we should also be honest about who we are and what we've done. At the same time, scripture teaches us to consider others better than ourselves. What does that mean? You may look at this and think, but they're not better than I am. I have Jesus, they don't. I don't break people's windows, they do. How can they be better than me? It's a good question. Let's look at this verse in other translations. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. But, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourselves. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Everything Jesus did was to benefit someone else. Whether it was having a meal with them, having a conversation, bringing healing to a sick person, providing food, or even calming the storm. Everything he did was for the benefit of those around him. Including his death on the cross was done for me and you. But although these things were done for and often with other people, it was done to bring glory and honour to God. And what Paul is saying that in order to imitate Christ's humility, which is the heading of chapter 2 in some Bibles, in order to be successful in this, we should consider the needs of others. They are no, they are not better people in the sense that they are loved more or treated differently by God. He loves us all the same. What Paul is saying is that in order to live a life of humility similar to that of Christ, our lives are about others. The Salvation Army in Australia publicly declare that wherever there is hardship or injustice, Salvos will live, love and fight alongside others to transform Australia one life at a time with the love of Jesus. A mission of caring for people, creating faith pathways, building healthy communities and working for justice. For the UK and Ireland, saving souls, growing saints, serving suffering humanity sum up what, what we are all about. These principles echoed in Salvation Army's territories and commands right across the world. At LAN, our mission is being dedicated in living and sharing the gospel, so that others will become part of our disciple-making fellowship. For each person, there will be a different responsibility. Some are gifted with creative skills and will use that to deliver practical hands-on activities for people. For others, it is about hospitality, administration, encouragement, leadership, and many other things. Different skills, one purpose. Standing together in Christ. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his one 
a lonely song. Our song this week can be found in the devotion section of the 2015 Salvation Army Songbook. The song speaks about personal commitment to God, asking him to hold us close with his love surrounding us. But look closely at the words of verse 2. Lord, unveil my eyes. Let me see you face to face. Renew my mind as your will unfolds in my life. Is that your prayer? Do you want to come close to God and be surrounded by his love? Soaring with him like an eagle and led by the Spirit. May you echo these words as the music is played and the words are displayed on the screen. And then take a moment to share the prayer that will appear. May God bless you. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Renewed. Flowing from the grace that I found in you. And Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see.
Standing together in Christ is not easy, even for lifelong Christians, but not impossible. Each day, scripture has something new to tell us, something new to challenge us with, and something new to help us in our journey of life and journey of faith. I hope that in one small way, these videos are helping you think about how you approach things. Do you stand alone or do you avail yourself to the people and provision God has gifted you with? As you read through the follow-up tasks, remember you don't need to face life on your own. Standing together in Christ is an invitation for everyone. May God bless you.